Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. All right, let's get started. So it's pretty action-packed call today, actually. I've uh, got a bunch of things that I, I think we should cover um, and just generally excited to get going. Uh, glad that we could make it. Uh, recordings obviously started for those of you that couldn't make it. Uh, so yeah, a couple of topics that I want to ensure that we cover before like the usual sort of issues and discussion around the issues is, uh, again, as usual, like updates to content. Uh, we'll continue to make progress to get uh, more stuff out there for people to ramp up on Falcon Plus. Um, we've got a couple more minor points uh, to share around like uh, notaries and access to notaries. Uh, and then I have compiled some statistics because there's been a lot of awesome uh, momentum in this ecosystem in general in the last couple of months around like how data cap is moving. Uh, and so I wanted to dedicate some, some time to talk, talk about that as well. Uh, so first things first, we finally have a section in the official Falcon docs. So docs.falcon.io has a store section, which then has a Falcon plus section. Uh, so for those of you that are interested, uh, please take a look, please review and let me know if you have any feedback. Uh, you're welcome to make changes directly. Of course, this is all a public GitHub repo that you can address, but uh, in general, I expect this to be the main entry point for people who want to learn about the Falcon Plus program. Uh, so your suggestions would be incredibly valuable in making sure that this is a good source of knowledge and data for people. Um, Next up, uh, Kere mentioned at the last call that we have a frequently asked questions doc that was uh, put up for general review from everybody. It would be great if you could take a look. Uh, so right now it's got a bunch of different questions and answers. Um, I've got a link here. I'm gonna drop this. Well, well, we'll share the link to the deck so you all can take a look after the call as well. Uh, but yeah, please feel free to drop any suggestions. If there's questions that you think haven't been addressed or should be addressed, it'd be great to do so. Uh, if you have, improvements to the answers that are there, that would be even better. Uh, and the last call out is a repeat on the fact that we will be having a Falcon Plus Day Summit. Um, currently that's slated for May 11th. Uh, if you have a session you'd like to do, whether that's as a client or a notary or just an observer and a participant in the ecosystem, please reach out to either me or Megan Kleiman on Falcon Slack and let's discuss how we can get you onto the schedule. We're working on curating the topics and stuff. So this is a pretty hot topic right now and we'd love to make sure that you're a part of the program. With that, um, quick minor thing on notary identification side of things. Uh, there's been <laughs> some amount of confusion from questions that I, at least I've received in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and I know Kerry has also been getting pinged about this, but just generally, like, how do we understand the mapping between how to read somebody on GitHub versus how to read somebody on Slack? Uh, so I just want to put up this table that, uh, that Kerry compiled earlier today. Um, for those of you that are in the room, if you notice any immediate mistakes, please just tell, tell us right now uh, and we get them corrected. But of course, for those of you that are watching this later, uh, the link is in the deck. Uh, feel free to head over and check and, and make any corrections as needed. Uh, this should just serve as like a, this is sort of simple, like unblocking, hey, I want to reach out to a notary. I want to understand like what their Slack or their GitHub ID is. Here's how I should do it. Uh, because like now there's no obvious mapping. Any issues? Anybody spot any issues? I'm going to give, give it 30 seconds to see. Ooh, I found one. Okay, right. Uh, NeoGa's uh, GitHub ID is now NeoGa Web3. Right, on it, thanks. Yeah, so that, that's the only one that I see so far. Uh, and then Fenbushi is S-H-I, not S-I-H-I, but I think other than that, like we, we can continue to make progress, but it, it'd be good uh, to make sure that this is updated. I don't see, I don't see any comments or, or see anything in chat, so I think we're good to progress. Okay, so exciting uh, sort of new topic. I would like to make this like a more regular discussion as well and every single call if possible, but just in general, like how is data kept flowing? Uh, it's become much more of a theme in the last couple of calls. For those of you that have been around, you know that, uh, you know, a lot of good topics uh, and conversation have around, happened, have, have happened around like time to data cap, data cap flow. Uh, so I, I took a little bit of time to aggregate some of these metrics and Ideally, this becomes like a regular report that we can we can share and publish among ourselves as we continue to learn and iterate on the processes in this program. Uh, so a couple of points to highlight this week. First up, we're kind of averaging around eight-ish uh, allocations that are happening manually through GitHub at least. So this does not count the automated verifier. Um, but yeah, somewhere between like eight and 10 is what I'm seeing for the last couple of weeks. Uh, this is over the last four weeks. Uh, in the last seven days, I see at least 40 terabytes of data cap that have been allocated. Um, there were five net new applications this week. There were a lot of issues this week with applications that were duplicated. 
Uh, so a lot of like, it's like 20 plus like dupes uh, were created in the repo and then deleted, but like actually like five new applications came in, uh, which is a little less like week over week uh, than the last time we had this governance call. Um, and yet again, we're continuing to ensure that more and more notaries are, are being active. Uh, so Masaki is finally uh, been activated and ready to go on chain. Uh, glad that, you know, he's been unblocked. Um, and then Performance Notary as well started making their first allocations uh, uh, this week. So that's great. Uh, Math Wallet is still blocked. Um, so we'll be discussing this later, but that should be the last notary left in terms of making sure like technically they are able or unable to make their allocations on chain. But the, some of the more interesting statistics at the meta level for the program. So it was about just slightly over two pebby bytes of data cap that was grounded uh, two notaries for allocation between like the start of this program and today. So far from at least one of the dashboards, uh, what I'm seeing is about 885 pebby bytes of that has been allocated uh, across roughly 250 like allocations of which about 150 are automated and the remaining uh, you know, 100 are coming from like GitHub issues and stuff. And so that represents about 40% of all the data cap being allocated to clients. Uh, which is awesome. Like, congratulations to notaries for making this like great progress. Like, of course, we've got more to go, uh, but it's still an important mi milestone, and we should acknowledge that we're working together as a community and improving our processes. Um, and of that, only about 175 Pebby bytes has actually made it into deals with miners. So clients today, on average, are roughly using about 20% of their data cap. And so that, to me, actually is a little lower than I expected, um, but. Of course, like, you know, deal making in general in Falcon is not the easiest thing. And again, something that's continuing to improve as, as clients are exploring. But I wanted to just toss these up here um, and see if anybody had any reactions. Anyone have any thoughts? Uh, just going to open the floor for a minute to see uh, if folks have anything they'd like to share. Feel free to use the chat as well, of course. Okay, none. So hopefully these are not too surprising. Uh, we'll continue to track this. Uh, and speaking of tracking this, um, I don't know if Andrew Hill is in the call at the moment. Uh, Andrew, if you're here, feel free to unmute and, and talk through this stats thing that you threw up. If not, I can speak to it. <laughs> I'm here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, well, it's pretty basic. There's just, uh, it's just drawing on the GitHub API to measure some stats from the notary onboarding repo or sorry, the um, client onboarding repo. Um, and so if you go check out this uh, GitHub repo, it just is a Python um, notebook. And so you can read through what it's doing to pull the stats for each notary and then compile this table of stats. Um, and there's a little cron job on the repo itself. So it will re rerun the Python script every night and update the readme with this data. Um, it's kind of limited because it, it doesn't know much about being a notary, so it's not pulling out the um, not pulling out the text about the size of data caps or anything like that. It's purely about um, it's purely about data cap flow through the GitHub um, repo, and so yeah, could be useful. We can add more things if people spot other measurements that would be helpful. But otherwise, it's on autopilot and it'll just keep updating every night. So that's awesome. Yeah, I, really, I noticed that you also had a history sort of tab that you created, which I think is incredible. Um, I'm hoping that like we get to a place where we, we have like a more standardized like, reporting format on data cap flow that we, we can share in each of these calls. Uh, and maybe like comparing the history like becomes like an important part of that. So like these, these statistics that I caught on the previous slide, plus like what is the actual responsiveness and the time to data cap looking like uh, from existing notaries. Um, yeah, and if anybody remembers some of the comments I made a few weeks ago, this is really motivated by trying to measure what the experience of the client is. So how long are they waiting? Are like are they getting rejected more often? They're being accepted. Those sorts mm -hmm. of metrics, and it's not really meant to be any kind of measurement of a specific notary or anything like that. So just to decouple those thoughts from people's minds. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this is more about like efficiency in the process and understanding yeah. like how we can make things better. Um, for the notaries that you know you're looking at these numbers some of you might be reacting to like larger numbers for days granted like please you know heavy caveat this ecosystem and program is extremely early like a lot of us are learning there were plenty of technical glitches along the way as well 
Uh, and so, of course, some of these numbers are a lot higher than expected. Um, and so ideally, the client experience does become easier. And so we should continue to talk about that as a theme uh, for this program. Uh, cool. With that said, uh, let's jump into a couple of uh, updates in general for notaries. I wanted to talk a little bit about the mass wallet notary situation that went down uh, last week. Uh, so basically, there was issue number 107, which was meant to finally grant math wallets notary its data cap grant, uh, which didn't go through the first time around, actually, uh, from the initial um, the round of elections. The what, what we learned, actually, which was really interesting, uh, oops, I'm pressing all sorts of buttons. Let me find a way to stop doing that. Back, 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 back. Cool, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so in 107, we attempted again to actually get notary status granted to the address that was supplied by the math wallet uh, folks. And it turns out that because that address had actually been used to receive an automated uh, data cap account from verify.cliff.io, it was already registered on chain as a verified client and it had received like eight uh, gigabytes of uh, data cap. And so that obviously disqualified it actually from, from becoming a notary. And, and that's because of there's, there's two general tenets that I think not everybody knows about. And I just want to highlight, uh, which is firstly, uh, this one, I think more of you know about, but if there's an address that has received data cap, it can't receive data cap again. Uh, so this is currently, this is introduced as a measure at the start, just in terms of like how it was architected. Uh, it's not necessarily like the goal state. And so there's actually a FIP, uh, FIP 12, which was passed uh, two or three weeks ago, which now should enable actor implementations to allow multiple data cap allocations or top up allocations to the same address, uh, which should reduce the friction for clients who otherwise would typically have to go and create a new address each time. Uh, and so that'll get implemented by all of the Falcon implementations such as uh, Lotus, Forest, um, Venus in the next several months. Uh, until then, of course, it's still a requirement that a client needs to get a new address each time. Uh, the second thing is that if something has been, if an address has been mentioned on chain as a verified client, you can't then go and give it like verifier status. So verifier status, like we refer to as a notary status. Uh, and that's basically because like as an, as a player in this stakeholder, if you hold the role of a notary, then you should, that address that you own is associated with being a notary. Uh, if you're also a client, which could be the case, then you should have a separate address for that so that we can also track like transactions happening. Uh, across the board. And so all actions are auditable and trackable. And so in this particular case, it turned out that MathWallet's notary address that was supplied ended up being registered already as a verified client on chain and had received data cap. And so when the request went through to the root key holders to actually assign it the verifier status and give it the data cap that it was serving of, uh, the actor just actually erred. Uh, and what is interesting is that the reaction from the bot was that it looked like it had gone through because the message had been signed. Um, and then the fill info dashboard also showed that they had received data cap when in fact, both of those things are not true. Uh, and so we will be following up, uh, or at least I specifically will be following up with these two to ensure that like this gets corrected because of course, like we as a community are also looking at public source of data and those, those sources of data have to be uh, reliable in order for us to use them to make judgments on, on what's actually happening on state because not all of us are hopping into a node every single time uh, to see what's actually happening with the movement of data cap. And so, just wanted to flag that a new issue was created, which is now number 114. Another request has been sent to the root key holders. Uh, hopefully that should get signed. And you know, the MathWall team, uh, if you guys are watching this, you know, hopefully very soon, you should be unblocked and able to make data cap allocations. Any questions on that? Great. That just means you guys are all amazing and you understood everything I said first time. Phenomenal. Uh, it just means so, it was such an amazing explanation, you know, that the, it left no room for, for any confusion just, or doubt. It sounds like I just talked too much is what happened. Uh, but if anybody has any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or, you know, we're going to force follow up in Slack afterwards. Uh, thanks, Megan. As always, I'll still take the compliment. Um, <laughs> the, the, the other thing I did want to bring up is uh, this concept that we've talked about a bunch around elections. So in the last call, uh, we addressed like separating top-ups for existing notaries that demonstrated good practices versus electing new notaries. Um, and Dr. Ann Chen actually raised an excellent point that like the process should still be the same across the board. Like we shouldn't 
have a difference in process so that we always have like consistency in the methods that we're using as a community to elect and give no trace data cap grants. Um, in general, it seemed at that point that the room agreed with that. And so uh, assuming that, that that is still the case, I'd like to propose that we kick off a new round of elections uh, soon. As you saw on the earlier slide, like 40% of all data cap has already been allocated and we're moving at a pretty consistent rate, like nearly 10% a week. Uh, and if that's the case, like given how long notary elections took the last time around with people uh, that were new to the process, learning how to write an application and then the analysis of all the applications plus the rubric plus get, getting everybody on chain, uh, it's like at least several weeks out anyway. And so it's probably a good time to open up uh, elections, both for existing and for new notaries. And I'd like to propose that we increase the amount of notaries per region, which was previously set at a target of three uh, to a target at five. Uh, and that's mostly to introduce more notaries into the mix, uh, continue improving the experience for clients as well as for notaries that are then enabling the clients. Uh, and just in general, like data cap does not need to be a difficult or a scarce thing for people. Like if, if somebody is truly bringing a useful, legitimate use case of Alcoin, they should be able to get the data cap that they need. And so uh, my assumption is as we increase the number of notaries, we are likely to increase the responsiveness of the notaries. We're also likely to learn a lot more about the use cases that we can serve as a network and, and what we believe we value uh, and collect additional data on how we can continue to improve the Falcon Plus program. Uh, and so this is, I, I expect this to be a, a potentially controversial discussion topic. So I did want to like earmark enough room for it. Uh, so with that, I'd like to open up the floor for a few minutes and hear any opinions, uh, hear thoughts from people in the room. What, do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you think we should do it differently? Uh, this is an excellent chance to share your opinion. I agree. I think it's great. <laughs> you and I talked about this before, so it's a little bit of a, uh, you know, like a stack deck, but. Uh... Yeah. Okay. Uh, when you say election open up to everyone, who's everyone? Like everyone on GitHub or everyone on everyone who's everyone? It would be anybody that wants to apply, but it would be through the GitHub application process, uh, Dr. Shin, like similar to last time around. Uh, where we you had that like full application form that you would fill out. Uh, of course, it's a lot easier for people that have already filled out the application to fill out like a lengthy application again. Uh, but hopefully, that's not not like a difficult thing. I got a question in the chat from someone, so I'm just going to share just the question, which is basically, if we have each region having five notaries, would that include the existing notaries or not? Um, and so. Just want to share a little bit of context like when we said three notaries first time around the only reason certain regions have more than three notaries is because of like perfect ties in the rubric scoring and uh, we as a community sort of agreed to skew towards adding more people to get more activity in the ecosystem and so if i remember correctly uh china and north america as regions ended up having more than three notaries but every other region was three or less and so what i would say here is I think we should probably hold to the same principle, which is every region should have five notaries, uh, which includes the existing and or new notaries. And again, if there's ties, we can either use the same heuristic or we can introduce a new decision-making framework. Uh, but this way, at least we're increasing the total amount of like notaries in, in other regions as well. Uh, and yes, uh, current notaries would have to apply again if we went by this process. Uh, the benefit of this though, is that if you, if you do remember the notary rubric had an element of it, which was based on past allocations as a notary. And so as you apply again as a notary, the likelihood that you get objectively scored to have even higher data cap allocations will continue to increase. What are, for, any, any other opinions, any thoughts on this? Even if, even if you just want to, you know, drop in chat or unmute to just say you agree, it'll be good to, so we can ensure that, uh, you know, we drive. drive okay, so, so my understanding is current notaries, that's all of us here, have three apply, and there's no guarantee that we'll be accepted this time, but we get, we get a higher chance. Uh, that is correct, but the assuming the rubric is the same as what we did last time, then it takes into account the fact that you were a notary in the past and successfully allocated data cap in the past, uh, which adds like a scoring parameter. So the likelihood that you were, you served as a good notary for the ecosystem should substantively uh, boost your ability to continue serving as a good notary for the ecosystem. Thank you. 
Yeah, um, Andrew, I see you have a hand. Uh, yeah, I was just curious about, um, yeah, like kind of matching the client demand. Um, because one thing that is kind of easy as a, as a notary is to just lose attention to it, you know? Like I have yeah. to remind myself that I'm a notary and have a reminder to go and check the status of applications. Um, and the client flow is pretty minimal in some regions. So I'm just wondering, you know, if the if you're gonna go with five for all, if you had considered that and like had some thoughts about it. Yeah. Kind of what was, yeah, just some, any thoughts there? Yeah, I think it's a great question. So I, obviously I'm just one opinion. Um, I'd love to hear other opinions as well. Uh, I know, Megan, when I brought this up to you as something I wanted to propose today, you had a very similar thought. So maybe it's worth you sharing your opinion as well. Uh, but my thinking, Andrew, was along the lines that like, if you look at the way nodes were initially set up, they were, it was across like two slight, like two parameters, if I can call it that. So one was region and the second was use case, uh, where certain nodes effectively uh, wanted to specialize in a particular kind of client. Um, and what we've seen between that round of elections and now is that like, though those things are still idealistic and like good ways in which we should slice the pool of available notaries because we do want to use people's expertise in a way that it'll benefit the network. Uh, the stage that we're at today is that like the clients that are there today, as long as you know they actually want to come onto Falcoin, they're going to go to as many notaries as possible. And what we're seeing is that notaries from different regions are still serving uh, the demand of uh, of clients that are not in their region, as well as clients that may or may not line up exactly with the use case that was proposed. Um, the degree to which this is executed is not consistent. Uh, so certain notaries tend to adhere more strictly to their policies, whether that's based on region of operation or type of use case, but others are a little bit more liquid uh, with their allocation of data cap. And so at this point, like I don't really have a super strong uh, desire to push one way or another. I like the idea of having as many like a, a consistent target across the set of regions so that we have the geographic uh, distribution that would be great for this community from like even from like a community development and business development standpoint um, and i do think that this will continue to serve as the foothold as in the future if we have many more notaries and many more clients that kind of specialization and distribution will end up being valuable uh, but i do agree with you that i don't think it maps identically to, to much of the demand that we see today uh, because if it did then we'd have skewed notaries in the greater China region in Europe and in North America. Andrew, my first thoughts were the same as yours, that, uh, that it would make sense to have more notaries in areas where we're having more demand. Just like a confirmation of the, of the thought. <laughs> yeah, no, no, this is great. Um, Andrew, go for it. I was actually trying to thumbs up that time. I got it, but I hit that <laughs> hand up. Uh, yeah, that all sounds good. I mean, I am a little worried about the client flow and engagement of the Phil Plus uh, notaries. Just in that case, if if you have a, if you have a lot of notaries and we haven't built up the flow yet, um, mm -hmm. but I mean, I'm down to experiment too. I don't, I'm not like a hard opinion here. Um, and then for reapplication, re yeah, that makes sense. I think we had a much more ambitious goal of of our own role as a notary. Um, based on where Filecoin was, and then um, could definitely could definitely rescope that and think of different regions and things like that too. So, yeah, all interesting. Uh, so I actually think that the region thing is is something we can we can continue to talk about. Um, the next step for this anyway would be for me to open a discussion topic, and so we can we can agree to basically put the conversation into the issue and depending on what the pervasing, uh, pervasive opinion ends up being, we can go based on that or we can run a quick poll on it either later this week or next week or by the next call. But ideally, yeah, I'd like to propose that we get to consensus relatively quickly and, and hopefully like by end of this week or next, we open up the application process for both existing and new notaries. Um, does that sound reasonable to folks on the call? Zhu uh, Hao Chen? Please feel free to you know share your uh, thoughts. Yeah, yeah, but I got a specific question for us because uh, as a one of the, I mean, we are the like the biggest uh, notaries, and we still got like a lot of allocated data cap, and mm -hmm. so for the new round, do we have to like attend it again, or we yeah. we we can just wait for the next round for for to to like wait for our unallocated data cap to be spent? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I don't actually have a great answer to that question. I was thinking about this earlier and 
it's tricky to basically like I don't think it's reasonable to push you to apply again, considering you're right that you have a majority of your data cap left. Uh, and I think it's okay for you to apply in the next round. But what I didn't, what I couldn't really form a strong opinion on is like what are the implications of that like for other applications that are coming in from the China region, for example, right? Because you'd be occupying one of the spots um, for a notary in that region. And I don't know if that has implications on like, does that mean we we target like you plus five more or does that mean we still target five total? I don't know. I would love to hear, you know, maybe even your thoughts if that's something that you have an opinion on or, or anybody else that's in the call. Yeah, I mean, I'm okay with like adding more notaries to our regions, but yeah, uh, I, I, I don't think that that would be a problem for us. Uh, Masaki, you have a hand. Uh, hi, Deep. Uh, just lurking in the back here. Uh, thanks, by the way, for helping us in fixing our allocation I'm glad issue. I got started. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I understand that data cap allocation granted will somehow improve the application chances of a notary on the next round. But how will this impact notaries that had a technical issue like me preventing me from giving allocations? I mean, how will that be treated and accounted for when I reapply on the next round? Yeah, um, I think that's it. That's a great question. So well, the rubric scoring, if I remember correctly, it should be like you successfully allocated up to X amount of data cap in the past. Uh, and so I think it shouldn't negatively impact you. And if it does, we should find a way for it not to, because I think we would, as a community, generally agree that like a technical issue should not be held against uh, your ability to, to serve as a notary in the network. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. And I did see that you've already started allocating data caps. So nice job on uh, not wasting any time. Once yes, the, yes. <laughs> once your address was unblocked. That's great. Thank you. Any other thoughts on this? If not, uh, I know there's a lot of people that can make it to this call, like this particular time slot is the difficult one for the Europe region as well. And so um, though we have more of the representation from Asia, we don't have as much from Europe. And so I think the right next step is, as I was mentioning earlier, I'll kick off a discussion topic today and we should uh, have some conversation on that in case you do have a differing opinion. Uh, and then we can use that to arrive on a con some sort of consensus for next steps in the next few days. Great. Uh, unless anybody has any other thoughts in the next 30 seconds, I'm going to move to the next slide uh, on open issues. Great plan. Great plan. All right. I want to pr uh, preface this real quick by calling out that our notary governance repo currently has 100 issues, if you look at the issues, which is cool. Uh, of which 18%, because of my phenomenal mathematics, uh, uh, are currently open. Uh, so that's 18 out of 100 issues are currently open. Uh, I just wanted to, you know, prod the community in general and just say, like, a lot of those issues are interesting and important conversations that are going to shape the way in which this program evolves. A lot of them have been open for a while. I'm going to make an active effort to push closure towards uh, some of the points that were raised in those issues. So I would also like to give you a call to action to take a chance to review that open issues tab on the notary governance repo uh, and see if there are any that you particularly have a strong opinion on that you'd like to share your thoughts on uh, as we try to make an effort to make progress. Um, a personal sort of goal for me would be that before we have this next round of elections close out, uh, the set of issues that were raised based on the previous election have been accounted for and have correctly influenced uh, this round of elections, because we should learn from our own processes and past experiences. And I think looking at the issues that were created during that time are, is a good way to do that. Cool. Uh, that being said, let's talk a little bit about the current issues. So the first one uh, was around the formation of a tribunal for Falcon Plus stakeholders. Uh, so we had a pretty intense conversation about this two weeks ago. Um, the general conclusion was actually to use an existing tool, which is Philpol. Uh, with the optional and potential ask of like forking Philpol for it to work for Falcon Plus uh, specifically. So like uh, how are votes of different community stakeholders in this ecosystem, which is different than the rest of the general Falcon ecosystem. Like if you're a notary versus a client versus a minor, it has like different incentive schemes and, and, and roles in Falcon Plus. Um, and so I think I, I, I want to use this as an opportunity to say that that was a very productive conversation. 
I think that given how the conversation went last time, I wanted to raise it in this call as well and make sure that people uh, were generally on board with it. But I, the, the call was basically, we either decide by, uh, by large group consensus or we decide by Philip Poll for the time being with the option of forking Philip Poll in the future. Um, and before I, we sort of lock that in together as a community, I want to make sure that it's being brought up in at least two governance calls because then we have coverage across time zones. Uh, so for those of you in the chat uh, and in the call today, would love to hear if for some reason you don't like the idea of sort of putting into stone that we can turn to Phil Poll. Um, and of course, on Phil Poll, there are many ways to prioritize uh, a decision. Like we can look at raw power, we can look at party adjusted power. Uh, we can look at like the number of people that are voting. And in the case of Falcon Plus, it's much more likely that we would skew towards the individuals that are voting as opposed to their representation on the network. Because of course, like we're, we represent a small part of the network, uh, albeit a growing part of the network. Uh, but yeah, uh, that being said, yeah, just want to just want to make a quick call out and say that this is something that's going to tactically impact the way in which we continue to make decisions. And so I wanted to give the floor to anybody that had uh, any thoughts on this uh, before we move forward. I definitely think that between the uh, forking fill pole and keeping fill pole, just trying to use it, um, that just trying to use it as it is and seeing how it works seems like a a more straightforward call. Plus one. Tends to be the case in tech. Use something that already exists is usually a good way to go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, always rely on people being lazy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, true. I see something in the chat. Plus one football Plus for one. the time being. Sweet. Yeah. Any other thoughts, opinions? This is an important one, so I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure we wait a couple of minutes uh, to ensure people. Have, and, and if anybody wants me to uh, go into the details for the issue again, please also say that. Um, I am happy to talk through the details uh, from the conversation last time. I say it never hurts to talk through the details. Mm. Sure. Yeah. Let's do it. Uh, so the initial recommendation was basically: Do we get a tribunal uh, set up based on the various stakeholders that would be in the ecosystem? So like. For example, uh, one of the notaries, one prevalent client or minor, and then maybe like somebody from the governance side of things, like from the Falcon Foundation, for example, and have like a rotating set of people that, because they serve as the voices of the community, could help drive decision making for this, uh, this program. And the conversation was more around the fact that the program is still relatively early. Uh, there's not like that many people that are actively involved to the point where we need like individuals, like sets of stakeholders to be represented by single people because everybody is here and everybody is able to participate and voice their opinions. Uh, and so then we started looking at like, okay, if, if we're going to have active discussions where everyone's participating, there's a chance that some issues just never get closed out, which is evidenced by the fact that we have issues that have been open since December. Uh, and so for those, uh, we were like, okay, in the case that there's no obvious like direction or consensus that the community is heading towards, then we need some sort of objective mechanism. And so that's when Philip Poll was recommended because that's been used uh, for FIPS recently uh, with a decent amount of success. Uh, and so the, the proposal was effectively, instead of having a tribunal, why don't we use Philpo where all of us get to, get to contribute our votes uh, and we use that as an initial decision-making framework upon which we can continue to iterate um, and improve. And if the, the need comes to fork Philpo and make a version of it for Falcon Plus, then that's something that the foundation was willing to give a grant for uh, in the future as well. Uh, and so that's, that's the general crux of the issue. Hopefully you follow that. Uh, if you didn't or have any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, if not, you know, feel free to share any thoughts that you might have. If not, I think I'm going to consider that like we're generally in agreement on this. And as Andrew said before, we're iterating, learning as a community, and we're we're happy to experiment together. Uh, and we can always make changes. I'm going to use this as a timely sip of coffee and watch to see if there are any other thoughts. Cool. With that, I'm going to switch to the next topic, uh, which is this general like set of uh, issues that are currently open that uh, you know have some phenomenal suggestions around uh, improving time to data cap. Um, Andrew's kicked off a bunch of these. Uh, I have some updates I'd like to share for some of them that have been open for a while. But before we get into that, there was a new one that was filed in the last week around adding an auto close bot. Um, Andrew, if you'd like to unmute and talk to it for a minute or two, that'd be great. If not, I can always speak for you. 
I do that okay, very well. I mean, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, yeah, we should put an auto close bot on the issue. I don't think it was my idea. It was somebody else's idea. It might've been your idea, but I, uh, I thought I needed an issue and to push it forward. Actually that, uh, that stats table from the repo that I put together that you showed earlier um, is a good indicator of why, because basically if issues are left open, it's actually like really hard for us to measure the quality that we're giving because oh, we're just waiting for clients to sit there respond and respond. And I've experienced myself that clients will leave sometimes for weeks. Right. Um, and so we should, if we just had a bot that was closing these things automatically so that we just had a precedent across all applications. So we didn't, we basically just had a rule and clients would agree to it. We'd, we'd have to do it. And there we go. Yeah. Um, I think that makes sense. Uh, the, the question I'd have for this, which is the same question I raised when we talked about it last time was like, what do we feel is a good amount of time to give someone? Um, and you know, this number has been jumping up and down based on like a lot of recency bias and a lot of conversations that we've been having. Uh, but I'd love to hear if there are any like strong opinions on like what we think is reasonable amount of time, or maybe you as a notary based on the experiences you've had for the clients that you ended up giving like data cap allocation to what was, what was that experience like in terms of interaction and how quick was that relative to uh, cases where you didn't uh, and what's a good, like, what's a good amount of days? Is it like five days, 10 days? Is it a month? Well, just cause I had the mic already. Uh, the, uh, it doesn't matter because the, I mean, it matters only a little bit because they can always just reopen it. I don't think there's any permissions on the repo that keep people from reopening it. So being like respectful, but aggressive. So like, I think the number we were floating around previously was like 10 days. seems like ample time. Mm -hmm. Even if they were away on vacation for a week, they'd still come back. It would still be open, um, but eventually closing. It sounds reasonable to me. I'd love to hear if there are any other opinions. 10 days sounds great. And just to be clear, this, this would be like last action taken by client or last action taken by anyone? Well, if you want to use a pre-canned bot on GitHub, I'm not sure how much you'll be able to control that. I'm not sure like what options are there. So maybe last action by anyone then. Yeah, it could be. Could be. Yeah, fair enough. Cool. So I, I think that in general, like people are probably going to be fine with this. I'm just in accordance with what we discussed, we should, you know, keep the, keep the discussion going um, and then make sure we get some more opinions. If not, I think this is a pretty reasonable thing. And, and Andrew, maybe we can talk about like uh, next steps to implementing something like this. Like it seems relatively basic. It seems like something even I could do uh, using like the generic like, GitHub bots that exist. And so uh, given how the discussion evolves in the next week, I think this is something that we can move up to the category of like actually implementing pretty quickly. Cool. So on the other ones that have been sort of pre-existing a little bit, so 103 and 104, um, I guess uh, it's, it's worth digging into these a little bit. So 103 was around the idea of like removing inactive notaries. Um, I thought about this a little bit more uh, this past week, actually, because we were looking at like unblocking notaries that have been blocked for quite a while uh, and like dashboards getting updated. And then, of course, we actually had a notary that stepped down because they felt like they couldn't serve uh, based on the time that they had at the, at the point. Um, and I do, do think that this would be a good mechanism for the community. Uh, Andrew, I know you proposed like something like two weeks initially. I'd like to say that like, I think my current opinion is that that might be a little aggressive. And I was going to propose basically like one month and you get flagged and then you basically have like two weeks or a month after that uh, to get activated. And, and we can always make this more, more aggressive over time. Um, and, and so I sort of proposed this uh, to a couple of people and, and, and not everybody agreed. And so I want to bring it here and see uh, what some of the other notaries feel is like a fair amount of time or based on like your individual schedules, your, your holidays, how busy you get at work and things like that. Like this is of course not your, your primary job. Uh, would love to hear like what you think is a reasonable amount of time or like a reasonable expectation to set with notaries around like how long we typically should wait uh, before like getting serious about like having a notary either step up um, and serve or not. Uh, but yeah, my, my proposal would basically be like, let's keep that number between like one to two months, assuming that like once every three to four months in the future, we could, we could do like new rounds of notary elections. Uh, and so that way there's always like some amount of time between 
uh, between like how long inactive notaries are not not acting versus like elections and that lag is not like, super massive basically. Yeah, once a quarter. Yeah, I think once a, once a quarter would be great if we get to that point. Um, but then, Dr. Ann, like, what do you think is a reasonable time frame for removing like an inactive notary? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, every two to three months, I would say. Oh, no, no, because that would be too, uh, too yeah, once a quarter also. Also once a quarter? Yeah, that's, that's like three months. That's like six, yeah, three months, six meetings, three months. Andrew, what are your thoughts? Like, I know that you wanted to skew on the lower side for this uh, with the initial proposal of two weeks. Uh, yeah, I can see the argument for wanting longer. Like, okay, so people shouldn't be applying to be a notary if they're not prepared to verify people. But I can understand maybe in the future we have people that are applying to be notaries that they expect to say hire somebody to do that role for their company. And so you wouldn't do that before being accepted as a notary. So I can understand other positions might, where it might take longer. I feel like a month is a good, it's a good compromise. Okay, <laughs> a month. <laughs> yeah. What if, like, we do, what if we do one month for like, <laughs> one month for like a serious notification or like a flag and then like basically two weeks after that uh, they'd be removed. So like a month and a half in total, but like one month for you to get like flagged and alerted and, and sort of like called out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, after a month, give a, a warning. Yeah and uh, another week. After the I feel like the week. advantage of the shorter time though is that you know, like when it's only, you know, 14 days, like, you know, if it's been 14 days and you haven't, you know, you haven't taken any actions as a notary, you know, right. like, uh, I think that like at the time of a couple months, it's easy to be like, oh, well, I still have time, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's, I think, th I think we're gonna face this problem less and less. Uh, it seems like a lot of people that were taking a lot of time at the beginning actually um were having just issues and we probably shouldn't face those issues as much anymore but um but also it gets me wondering about that client flow and if, if we mm -hmm. add if we add five to every region um you know will they get an application in the first two weeks yeah exactly yeah that's interesting I wonder, yeah, I wonder if there needs to be some association here with like the last like application received as well, right? So maybe it's like one month of latent, like four weeks, let's say four weeks, because we like to operate on two week cycles here with this program. So four weeks from your last action as a notary, assuming you had a request comes in is like a, a warning. And then two weeks after that, you have to take action. Otherwise, like we request you to step down for the time being. How does that sound to people? Yeah. Yes, that sounds good. Because the other thing is like, to be honest, like all of you that are serving as notaries, like you're doing this because you, you know, you believe in the program, you believe in the network, you're making time out of your lives, like service fiduciaries for the network. Um, and like part of where, where like I'm thinking about this is like, I don't really want to make this any harder for notaries than it is because the notary role is a difficult and a thankless role. Uh, in many ways. And so you're like serving the network to make it better. And so adding stipulations that make that like a higher barrier to entry, like I don't really want to do that as much uh, is, is part of like what I'd also present as reasons to not like reduce that number as much. But at the same time, we want to make sure that data cap is liquid and is flowing. Uh, and this is one of the ways in which we can like track that more actively and make that successful. Um, Sounds yeah, like you're arguing for Anshin's number then of a quarter. Sorry? It sounds to me more like you're arguing for a quarter, which I think is a reasonable amount of time too. I mean, I think they're all reasonable amounts of time. They all have yeah. time. Yeah, I, I don't think that having more time like makes it, I don't think that having less time makes it more arduous. I think the thing that like feels bad is like if you ha had something and it was sitting uh, and you didn't realize it, um, kind of like back to Andrew's like, uh, what's the, the client yeah. flow. Um, uh, yeah. And so like, I, I don't know, like I, I'm not sure if having more time actually makes it like a more- uh, Right. Yeah. I mean- I agree with Megan. Cool, thanks Emma. Um, that makes sense. 
I think the there's there's only there's I guess like one of the things is like maybe it's better like we need to get better about notifying notaries that have stuff that's looming that they haven't had a chance to follow up on like Andrew like the real problem we're trying to solve here is that clients like don't have like don't get responses for like data cap applications and so like motivating notaries to respond faster is like in like a separate problem than removing inactive notaries because the other downside to removing inactive notaries is effectively that uh that data cap effectively like that we we thought we were giving to the community and was like coming in to be distributed is is like disappeared um and so like a really slow notary could be like better than a no like not a notary uh in, in from like purely like the element of the existence of data cap however from a client experience that's not a good experience and so uh, i would say we should get like more aggressive with like notification bots and we should get more aggressive with like follow up uh, like follow up in, in slack or in Falco, in Falcon, uh, sorry, Falcon slack or github or whatever each notary chooses to be like alerted by uh, before we decide to get aggressive about removing notaries i think yeah. that sounds really reasonable yeah right Bye. like two, uh, two weeks uh, like a warning after two weeks another warning like uh, three warnings you are striked out something like that you know every two weeks you give out a warning there was I, I, another I, voice that came that was cut off uh was it mine no i heard yours i think there were mm -hmm. there a couple of people said said stuff at the same time so please feel free to unmute and then share well i was just gonna say I'm, I, i'd be happy to like note this and just close that issue for now uh, and say mm -hmm. that we'll um, that will try to, you know, ramp up the, the automation here. And if we see, uh, sort of a lot of warnings start coming, we'll, we can reopen it and think about offboarding later. Cool. Uh, also to it being a thankless job, maybe, maybe we can have more automation around saying, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you to all of you awesome notaries. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is uh, this is not automation, but we can work on that. <laughs> uh, plus one. But it's super appreciated. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like the the current 175 Debbie bytes of uh, deals, thank you at the moment. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be many more. Uh, <laughs> Okay, Andrew, I think that that's fine. I, I think that's fine. I do think we should probably say that like if you did nothing in the quarter and another round of elections comes up and you didn't allocate anything, then... Well, then you're, that, that gets discounted anyway. Like what, like, what happens to... Because you in the rubric, you actually don't get... You don't get the benefit of being a notary in the past. And so theoretically, you just sit like latent on a bunch of data gap and I would just continue to sit. Uh, and maybe that becomes a liability at some point. So I would actually say we should say like, if you haven't like reacted as a notary between like notary elections so roughly once a quarter, we can just say maybe three months, then like we should just remove the allocation. And then for the time being, we focus more on like responsiveness and automation for responsiveness. How does that sound? Okay, I see plus one for Megan, but that's only because I have one video on my screen, so. Mm. Uh, yeah, sounds good. <laughs> okay, I think I think I think Andrew, depending on how you feel as the originator, I would say feel free to post an update on that, and then we can either close it out or, or discuss it again if needed. Sounds good. Cool. Uh, and then the 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 next one was on adding anticipated response time and throughput. So uh, this was the first issue that I think spawned like a bunch of really good and creative like conversation around like how we can track like responsiveness in GitHub, uh, including the data that you now sourced uh, Andrew and are publishing via the cron job every day. Um, is there anything that you feel went uh, unaddressed from that? Like for me, I think the one thing that I wanted to take away from that issue is basically like we probably want to add like in the notary election process this time or in the application process, like part of you signing up to be a notary is that yes, you will respond to issues within like X amount of days is, is like a thing that you're signing up for and you're acknowledging that you're signing up for it. Um, but other than that, plus the automation we're thinking of adding, plus like the tracking that we're all, we're starting to do. I kind of like figured that that's like, 
those are the main points I was getting at. Um, is there anything else that you feel should have been considered? Uh, nope, not off the top of my head. Okay, so I think that the next steps of that is like, I'll probably uh, make a separate like, like application process sort of refinement uh, proposal. And then I'd like to get some thumbs ups on that. And then accordingly, we can close out both this and then the new issue I'll file based on it. Sounds good. Sounds good. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, and then the last one is around like large data cap uh, projects. So like defining these as like one pebibyte or greater or even 500 terabytes or greater. And so uh, I've been doing a bunch of thinking on this. I actually spent some time like looking at ways in which we could pull this off. So issue 94 is like pretty active with like proposals and suggestions at the moment. Uh, would you know suggest, for those of you that are in the room, please take a look. Like this is going to be a serious, uh, game changer in terms of the scale of which like data cap gets allocated to specific projects uh, and especially projects that we believe like are mission aligned and, and bring value to the to the world and make the best use of Filecoin um, will be unblocked substantively uh, and so ensuring that we do this correctly is great and and the other thing I wanted to say is that the way in which this gets executed will likely also impact like the ways in which general like allocations will happen in the future like as a community together we want to move uh, towards more automation, better uh, monitoring, better understanding of like how data cap is flowing through the system and less time spent in like subjective, like nuanced um, things that require like more human interaction basically and make the system slower and more tenuous and, and take up more of your time and create toil. Uh, and so depending on how I think 94 gets wrapped up, we should think about like an initial implementation in the near future and probably use Starling as a good test case for something like that. Um, and then based on that, of course, I think we learn a bunch from that and start to bring it to like smaller, uh, smaller applications as well. So like clients that are requesting like a new allocation might be able to go through some amount of automation uh, if they're just getting a top up as opposed to like needing to go through an entire like brand new application each time. And, and so I think there's like some really interesting implications of this one. And so uh, the ask is uh, not necessarily to, to react now unless you already have thoughts on it, but more to just take a look at 94. Uh, and please share uh, any any thoughts that you might have on it. Cool. Uh, with that, I wanted to keep a few minutes for discussion. We end up usually running out of time at this stage. And so I wanted to make sure that we don't. And so two whole minutes. Uh, yeah, Andrew, go for it. Uh, yeah, sorry if I missed it. Is there a timeline you already have in mind for the new notaries? I, not explicitly. Uh, okay. I would like what I'm like off the top of my head right now, I'm thinking, We'll probably take a week or so to sort out like uh, like the things around like the total numbers per region, like what to do with pre-existing notaries that haven't run on a data cap. And then like, if we want to tune it to like the demand in the region as opposed to like a flat number. So I think it'll take about a week or so to resolve that. So sure. say we kick off like applications like at the start of the following week, we can keep applications open for maybe three weeks uh, and then scoring will take like a week. And so I, off the top of my head, I would say like five-ish weeks. Uh, which actually puts us right around Phil Plus Day, uh, which is May 11th. So maybe that's the day we shoot for, for the end. Of, yeah, so, very uh, convenient. Follow-up question. Um, and maybe this is a Phil Plus Day thing, but actually it sounds more like a maybe a notary call, a Phil Plus call thing. So the rubrics that we're using as notaries are are evolving based on what we're learning. At least my, mine is, and I've tried to communicate um, the first big change I made some weeks ago. And I have another change that I'm now looking through and considering making. And it's just, it's small, but it's significant. Anyway, um, as these are evolving, I, I, there seems to be you know a handful of them that are evolving independently. And so it might be interesting to dedicate one of these calls to presenting our rubrics mm -hmm. and trying to think of, especially if you want to onboard, if we want to double the notary size, it might be really interesting to document what are the different rubrics in use and what are the, some of the things that we're learning from them? Because as a new notary, it would be awesome to just pick up, you know, somebody's rubric and be like, yeah, I'm going to run with this as my yeah. starting point too. So yeah. anyway. That's a great suggestion. That's a really good idea. Um, depending, so I'm thinking of this one of two ways. Like one is either we make that a topic at full plus day and then have the applications close after that and just slide everything back. Um, or the others, like you said, we dedicate one of these meetings to that. Um, and have a session on that uh, where like, you know, 40 minutes of it is reserved for that kind of conversation. My, my feeling if you do it at Phil Plus Day though, is it's, it's sort of a snooze fest to talk about our rear bricks. So, <laughs> <am> I... 
<laughs> Maybe that says uh, more about your rubric than it does ooh. about the topic. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. yeah, that's true. And my <laughs> rubric. value. My rubric is is particularly boring. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so it just feels like we something we could jam out in a smaller call. Okay. Um, without putting everybody to sleep. <laughs> and maybe okay. maybe maybe presenting the results of like what are some of the common patterns and things like that and whatever. Yeah, it's a great idea. Okay. I think we should do that. Uh, we could also schedule like an out of band one for that um, to make yeah. it like uh, based on like the notaries that actually want to share and and time Don't zone force everybody to through people. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I think that that's a great suggestion. Um, I I'll follow up on that. Uh, I think this week. Any other open points for conversation discussions uh, from those of you in the room? Please feel free to unmute, drop in chat. I'm just going to leave this up here as the last slide. I'd love to see if there are things we can do around like why this, this client number is, is only a fifth of, of allocated data cap. I wonder what, what's whether it's just like people asking for a lot of data cap or if it's just like allocation, like usage of allocation is slow or if it's something else. I think there's probably some good, good takeaways for us. Data cap hoarding. What are you going to do? I just also realized that I should call this out for the recording. I said with notaries is 2.25. This is actually the total amount, not with notaries. So with notaries would be 2.25 tabibytes minus 885 tabibytes. So it's like 1.4-ish at the moment. Data cap hoarding is a real thing, though. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> it should not be a thing. That's for sure. And so we should all work towards that. Cool. Looks like the room is silent. Um, we're definitely uh, at and over time, so I don't want to hold you here. Uh, thank you all again for you know being a part of this awesome program. Really great to see the progress that uh, we made in the, in the last several months. And just getting together this data and getting to see a lot of this data was like awesome uh, for me, and I'm really excited to share it with all of you. And I'm also excited to continue to increase the the visibility and transparency we have in the program. So. If you have any ideas on that specifically, I'd love to hear them. Uh, let's talk uh, in the Phil Plus channel on Talk on Slack. Um, and the same applies to just in general, Python Plus Day Summit. If you have stuff you'd like to talk about or you'd like to propose is talked about, please reach out to either me or Megan uh, as we figure out like what's going to happen. Um, thanks again for coming. I, I have a wonderful rest of your days, depending on where you're in the world. Uh, take care and, and we'll talk soon.